Amen. Open your Bibles with me tonight to Exodus. As we continue our study through Exodus tonight, we enter into a new chapter in chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Tonight we're looking at the first seven verses. We've entered into a a new part of Exodus um, after the Passover and after the crossing over the Red Sea. Now we found ourselves in the days of grumbling. And this is where we'll stay for some time. And just like the last story that we found ourselves in, where the people grumbled, yet God provided, uh, the same is true in this story tonight. And I could say many of the same things that we said back with the Lord providing the quail and the manna in chapter 16. However, in this repetition of the same thing happening again, this time I want to turn our attention to the attitudes and um, specifically the grumblings of the Israelites. And I think it's going to be important for us, especially in terms of application. And so tonight's sermon is entitled, The People Thirst. And it's from Exodus chapter 17. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the, sin, from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there, thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt? to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? A little more, and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah, because the quarrel of the sons of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The truth of the matter is that we are a drama-filled people, each and every one of us and those people outside of these walls as well. I mean, is it any surprise to us when we turn on the television and there is an entire news network, E! News, dedicated to paparazzi and the drama surrounding the famous amongst us. I was flabbergasted as a child that this channel even existed because I'm like, what in the world do these people care about what's going on here? Why do we care of all of the drama that's happening in someone's life who we don't know anything about? And there's just little snapshots and pictures of it. But it doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter where you go to church. It doesn't matter what family you're in. Drama is going to happen. It's the human way. It's part of our nature. And it's Not any different for the people of God, especially here, seeing God's provision, seeing the miracles, seeing the things that they've seen, and knowing God as they know Him. It is something that breaks out in their camps. And we see it come to a head here even more so than that of the hunger that they had in chapter 16. In verse 1, we get the new problem. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel... This chapter, yes, is marked, or this section is marked by the quarreling and the grumbling of the Israelites, but it's also interesting that at every twist and turn, they're not called by just the elders of Israel. They're not just called by the men of the camp. They're they're called by all of the congregation of the sons of Israel. It happens to them all. It's common. And they journey by stages here. And I I think this verse is interesting before we get into the the crux of it all, because here in verse 1, we do see something about the migration patterns of the Israelites as they travel through the wilderness. Here, as they travel, they travel in stages. And so it's likely that they have the young men at the front in order that they would be in marching array, that they would have some scouts out a little bit further than that, that they have the women and the children and the carts and the cattle and all of these things following behind, and that there's some stages to this, that the danger would be scouted out, then the greatest, the strongest amongst them would go first, they would set up where they're going to go next, and then everybody would travel in once there's safety in the way. And so it, it seems here that there's some rhyme or reason to how they, they move through And we don't see a migration of just a parade of individuals going through the wilderness. 
This is important because when we look at it archaeologically, one of the issues of the Exodus is they say there's no archaeological evidence that millions of people walked through the desert in some giant migration. Maybe the answer is right here in verse 1. Maybe the answer is there wasn't a million people all at once traveling through the wilderness. Maybe there was some rhyme or reason. Maybe it wasn't just a straight line like we might imagine it, for they did this for 40 years. And they did it in a way that maybe would not be tracked by the ways that we're looking for it. Nonetheless, I wonder how you even track a group of migrants going through a desert, but I'm not an archaeologist. And so we continue on uh, to to the crux of the matter. What is it all about tonight? According to the command of the Lord, they leave, and they camped at Rephidim. And at Rephidim, we have the problem. There was no water for the people to drink. Now, I wonder... With the problem coming, whose choice was it to camp at Rephidim? We've had the Lord leading them by cloud and by pillar, but it it doesn't actually tell us here who who led them here. It tells us by the command of the Lord they do this, but are they traveling according to his command in the stages? Are they traveling according to his command to the destination they're going to? I don't know that it would matter one way or the other, but I, I do wonder if it's the people who led them to this point What a bad place for them to choose to camp. They need to blame themselves. And likewise, if the Lord leads them here, they should know because they've already seen it in the chapter previous, he's already provided. He's going to provide. There's no problem too great for him. And yet here's the problem in verse 1. There's nothing for the people to drink. And here in verse 2, the problem erupts. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. Now, remember back in chapter 16, we had some upset folks. When we look back at chapter 16, we have some people who are grumbling. Chapter 16, verse 2, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They even said in in verse 3 something very similar to what they're going to say in just a moment about the, the depth of their being upset with him. However, we also see here that this grumbling is is not all of it, but it erupts in chapter 17 into more than grumbling. It bleeds even to quarreling. And the reality is, oftentimes, problems are brought up, but solutions don't come with them. I love when, and I remember Kenneth McArdle would always say that he looked for managers and he looked for people who would not only bring him problems, but would bring him solutions. Those are the people he wanted in, 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 his, in his managerial experience, in his, in his companies, in his employment. He wanted somebody who would not just bring him the problem and expect him to fix it, but he looked for solutions as well. We don't see that with the Israelites here. They look for, they, they look for no source of their own, but they come straight to Moses with all the problems. In verse 2, they come to him and they say, give us water that we may drink. As if Moses, just like last time, could provide bread out of thin air, now he is well acquainted with the problem. Now let me pull water out of thin air. Let me cause it to rain for you. Let, let me make the water happen. It's not by Moses' hand that any of these things can happen, but they demanded of him. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? And this statement also brings about the question, why do you test the Lord? Far more often than solutions, problems bring bickering and grumbling and quarreling. And this is what we see here. The problem comes and the people know nothing except attack. And Here it is the leader of them that they attack. And likewise with it, it is the Lord whom they test. But if we're to apply this to us today, certainly for the church, we could say, yes, certainly as a pastor, I can tell you that many of the problems that the church faces, I bear the brunt of. The deacon body can attest that they bear the brunt of and they carry the burdens of it with them and all of these things. However, the reality is for the church, And we're going to see it in a minute in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that when one of us suffers, when one member of the body suffers, when one member of the body complains, the rest of the body is injured because of it. 
And this is especially true here for Moses because it does not stop with quarreling in Exodus 17. It continues in verse 3. The problem is then exaggerated. But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and Zed. The issue is water. The issue is there's none right here. A simple solution might be, Moses, why don't we go somewhere else? Moses, why don't we pray to the Lord? Moses, why don't we do something in order that we might see some water? But they grumble against Moses, and they say, very exaggerated, very dramatically, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Does it require all that, folks? It seems to be taking a, a, a little tiny problem, a, a problem of this right here, and blowing it way out of proportion. Oh, I recognize the need. We need water, folks. They're in the desert. Uh, we're not in the desert, but it's, it's pretty hot. I ran into one of my friends from the Breadsmith days the other day. Uh, I posted on Facebook. Some of you saw it. It was me and Joe. And we, were at the, we were at the bakery, and we were... It was, it was funny because we were full circle because I used to work at a bakery with him and now we're at a different bakery together. And so me and Joe are talking and Joe is actually from Zimbabwe. And his mom came down and she's from Africa. And he said, well, mom, it's really hot here. And she's like, I'm from Africa. I can handle this. And she gets off the plane in Mississippi and he said she has not stopped complaining about the heat since she got here. It's suffocating, she says. It, you, you can cut it. It's so hot. The air is so thick. I recognize what the people must be feeling because it's hotter than Africa in Mississippi. I recognize the need for water. But here's a tiny problem, something that has an easy solution. And what do they do? It blows up. It's exaggerated far beyond what it even is. And all of it is pointed here at Moses. Moses is the one who brought us out of Egypt. Moses wants to kill us. He wants to kill our children. He wants to take our possessions and kill our livestock. He wants to do it in a horrible way through thirst. And if we think that maybe this is akin to the manna of chapter 16, it is akin, but it is not the same. The people go much further this time, and we see it in, in verse 4. When Moses reflects back and calls upon the name of the Lord about the problems before him, he does not come before the Lord in the same way he did in chapter 16. In chapter 16, he came looking for solutions. Lord, the people are getting a little upset. They're getting a little rowdy. Can you help me out? In verse 4 of chapter 17, he comes as one who's about to die. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do to this people? A little more and they will stone me. Problems divide. And when they get to that point, somebody's going to leave injured. Moses is not only fearing that the issue will divide the camp anymore. He's worried that he himself will be injured, killed as a part of it. Over what, folks? Water. Water that they know God can provide. For he has provided in that he has split the water in two that they might walk on dry land. He's provided food just a chapter before. He even made up his own dish. Chef Yahweh made up manna in order that the people would be satisfied. If he can do this, can he not do exceedingly more? Yet this is what the people grumble against. It's silly. The problem is silly. Yes, there's a need. Yes, it's a, a, a substantial need for us to survive that we must have water, but it's silliness at the end of it. And the reality is, if we're, if we're to be honest about the problems that we have, first of all, as Americans, let's look at a world around us who does not have the needs that they have, and many of our problems seem trivial next to it. Uh, imagine, likewise, as the American church, when we look at the problems that our church has versus churches in third world countries, in violent, militant against Christian countries, our problems are easy breezy. Our problems are silly compared to the fact of where will we meet today for they burned down the place we met at last week. 
They killed the pastor last week. Where will we meet today? Our problems are silly in comparison. It's the silliness of it, but it's more than this. It's the wrongheadedness of how we fix it. Here the people did not ever come. The the only one thing they did right is, is maybe go to the leader. But at the end of the day, what should they have done well before that? They should have gone to God. For the leader can do no more than they can, for he is but a man. They could have gone to God. They could have seen what Moses has laid out again and again and again and turned to him first. But instead, we see a wrong-headed approach. They approach it with quarreling. They approach it with hatred. They approach it expecting man to fix it. Don't let man fix it, folks. Let God fix it. He is abundantly more able to fix any problem that we have than you or I or anyone else can bring to the table. It doesn't matter if it's a financial issue, God can provide. It doesn't matter if it's a personality issue, God can provide. It doesn't matter what the issue is, God can fix it exceedingly more than you or I can fix it. We are incapable of fixing it on our own. In fact, I think if we look at the track record of how much you and I have fixed our own problems, the reality is we've made it worse more often than we've made it better. But it's those times where we give it to God and we say, Lord, you can fix, for you know the hearts of men, for you are the changer of the hearts of men. You can fix where I can't. But I think what we also see here is a people who we ought to desire in one sense to be like. How awesome would it have been to walk through that Red Sea? How awesome would it have been to eat eat some manna? How awesome would it have been to do all of the things these Israelites are doing? Now, some of it, it's a lot of walking in the desert. I don't know if I'd like that so much. But the reality is God is ever present with them. They can literally see him guiding them. They can see the miracles happening. We ought to want to be like that. We ought to want to be in their shoes. Here is a people who they're not the church, but they're a people who are united in gathering together in the worship of God as we are. They have two wonderful leaders in Aaron and Moses. This is is a time to be a part of what God's doing. And yet it's through quarreling. It's through bickering. It's through the drama of water that they're about to destroy their leader. And we're going to get to Mount Sinai here, not far from it. And the people are going to get God to such a point that he's present with them, but he turns to Moses and he says, I'm just going to wipe all of them out that I might raise up a nation through you, Moses. And Moses talks God down. We're going to get there here soon. This is what dissension and division does. And folks, the application for that, there is no greater destroyer of growth. There is no greater defeater of the church. There is no greater um, stunter of growth. There is no bigger sucker of excitement than division, than grumbling, than quarreling. And so we need to turn to other places in order to find, to see. How ought we to do this? If you'll flip with me, and we're going to flip to several places here for just a moment. Let's go first to Mark chapter 3. We'll be there in just a few Sundays, uh, but I want, to, I want to preview this just as a verse for it's a kind of a proverb that Jesus himself is going to use from their day. Mark chapter 3. At the end of the chapter... In verse 25, he gives kind of a proverb of of their day, something that they would understand. We'll actually start in verse 24. Mark 3, verse 24. Jesus says this, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Now here he's referring to himself being a a worker of Satan, 
They're accusing him that he is working for Satan. This is what the Pharisees can come up with. This is their best shot. And he says, no, it can't be, for how could I cast out devils if I'm working for Satan? Because a house divided against itself cannot stand. But the truth of what he's saying, it's a, it's a truth nonetheless. He's using it as a truth to prove something, but he's using it as a truth. The church of God, likewise, if divided against itself, cannot stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Likewise, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Flip with me to another book we've recently read through. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians is going to deal with a lot of issues within the church at Corinth. One of them being divisions. 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through about 4 deal with the divisions that exist between a difference in leadership through the years. Some follow Apollos, some follow Paul, some follow Peter, some follow somebody else altogether. They've all got their favorite guy, and they're not coming to church unless he's preaching. And that's the issue that they're dealing with. And at the very forefront of the book in verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, we get a statement from Paul that shows us the severity of disagreements. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. If progress is going to be made, if the church of God is going to continue, Divisions cannot exist. It must be a like-mindedness on what? Not on water. Not on the age-old question of what color should the carpet be. Not on the, the, the small things, but what's the, what's the focus? It's on the mission. It's on the thing that Jesus sent us out to do. These are the things that we have the like-mindedness about. These are the things we fight over. If we're going to fight over anything, let's fight over what God said. What, what, what his purpose for us as a church is. For when that's taken from us, we ought as well just be a club that people gather together and join in order that they might just put a smile and face on and have some fun. That's not what we're about as a church. Those are things to fight about. But the little things, those are the disagreements that rise up the exodus type of disagreements. And so what does God's word say about those who would cause disagreements? Let's. Flip now to Romans. Romans chapter 16, he ends the book this way. Romans chapter 16, if we're on, I don't know why I'm flipping, because if we're on verse 1 of First Corinthians, I need to flip back one page to get to chapter 16 of Romans. Romans chapter 16, that wonderful verse in verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss, all the churches of Christ greet you. A very loving and united church. Within verse 17, the warning. Romans 16, 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. Likewise, I won't go there, but Titus chapter 3, he says the same thing. When there's people in the church who are causing dissension, when they're causing disagreements, what should the Israelites have done? I would have formed a different group. We got to get out of that. We don't need to go over there to Moses. I'm going to be minding my business in my tent. If nothing else, I'm going to get away from them. Because once you get sucked in, it's hard to get out. Then you take it all the way to Moses or the person that you're mad at. And the grumbling erupts throughout the congregation of the people of God. But Jesus, best of all, gives us a way to deal with our issues. Lastly, for this point, we'll look at Matthew chapter 18. Told you we'd be doing some flipping. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives us kind of a preview of this. Matthew chapter 5, he says, If you've got an issue with your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go settle it. In Matthew 18, we get some much more strict ways in which to deal with this. The reality is, dissensions and quarreling will destroy the church. Stay away from those who would be the leaders of the quarreling. But how do we deal with it as the church of God? Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 15. 
Like unto Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew 18, 15, Jesus more or less repeats what you ought to do. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. This is one of my favorite things to do in, in the school. I, I, I teach in church discipline every day at school. That's how I do my discipline. Little Johnny threw something across the room. I'm getting Susie and Sally Sue, and they're coming out in the hallway, and I got two or three witnesses who saw little Johnny throw something across the room. And I'm going to look at little Johnny after he's done told me and lied to my face that he didn't throw something across the room. I'm going to say, well, Sally and Sue both saw you do it, and in the presence of two or three witnesses, you're guilty. That's what the Word says. Verse 17, and if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, does that mean you go and you start your own grumbling crowd about the person who's grumbling to the church? No. Tell it to the church means to the authorities of the church, to those who can do something with it, who can go and take measures, who if it comes to such a degree, and I don't know, but the cliff, if we've ever had this in our history, where we've called a special called business meeting in order to revoke somebody's membership, but Lord help us if we ever get to that point where our disagreements get to such a point where we have to get to verse 17. Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Put them away. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind in earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if if two of you agree on earth about anything that a man may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. The last verses really proclaim the power of the church in unity. Let it not be so of the people of God, and let it not be so for the people of First Baptist Church that we are a people who would tear one another apart, and we would tear apart the things that God is doing because we're grumbling about things that are oh so small. Let us be a people who is an advocate for peace, for reconciliation, and for a continuance of the ministry. No matter what it takes for our pride, no matter what it takes for our perspective and our personal feelings, but that in all things we might love as Christ has first loved us. Because the very things we're grumbling about, look back with me at Exodus chapter 17, God is providing a solution. Verse 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Moses comes to God and he says, Lord, all of these things are going wrong. They're about to kill me. They're so angry. Who can put all this back together? And the Lord then responds to Moses in verse five, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. What's he doing? He says, Moses, get the staff. They're going to recognize the staff. Why? Because it's the very staff that parted the Nile River. It, 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 or it, you struck the Nile River with for the blood. Oh, excuse me, I'm getting my stories mixed up here. And this, this staff is one which is, which is powerful for it started the very first plague and every plague after that they saw by the power of this staff. This is the same staff which you held up and the Red Sea parted. All of what God has done up to this point is symbolized in the staff. Take that staff and walk in front of them with it. And take some of your boys with them, the elders. That way they're going to recognize, ooh, something big about to happen. It's going to trigger them. It's going to remind them, the Lord who has solved your problems before with water is solving your problems even still. The Lord, ooh, I need to go back to my positive phrase. Jesus, my Savior, is still working miracles today. Hallelujah. That the same staff is passing before them in order that they might look upon it and know the Lord God is still working. He provided before, and certainly He's going to provide again. You know, conflicts might not arise if we remember what the Lord's done. Conflicts might not arise if we recognize all that the Lord has done. folks. In our church, this is a church where we have had problems through the years. Some of you were here for them and some of you were not. Most I don't think most of us were here. I wasn't here for them. And there's been problems from long, long, long ago. And there's been problems all through the years. Has the Lord not provided that we would be where we are right now? 
Do we not recognize the season that we're in of God's providing? And if He's provided that we might make it through all of these seasons of struggle, is He not going to provide for us in the next one? Whatever struggle is next, whatever grumble is next, whatever quarrel is next, God's going to bring us through it. He's been faithful to do so in the past. Conflicts ought not to arise if we remember what God has done. And in verse 6, He does it again. Behold, I will stand before you. This is the Lord still speaking to Moses. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God provides for the people. And you know, it took all that effort, all that quarrel, and all that grumbling. And what did it take? It took Moses. It took one person. It didn't take the leader. It took Moses because Moses was the only one who did it. It took one person going to the Lord and saying, Lord, the people need water. And the Lord heard their cry, and the Lord provided. Couldn't we have circumvented a whole lot of stuff if we stopped halfway through verse 1 and we jumped all the way to verse 6? And they were going through the wilderness of sin, and they were going in stages. And they got to a place where there was no water. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock, and you shall have water for the people to drink. Problem, solution. But all the things that happened in the meantime, those things could have been avoided. For whenever the problem arises, God has the solution. And in verse 7, we have kind of a restatement of what we've already seen in chapter 16. In chapter 16, Moses and Aaron made a point that when you grumble against them, you grumble against God. But here, the real issue, the the, the proverb of it, the, the, the point of it all is really restated and more so than chapter 16. In chapter 16, it's like one of those where don't stand against the Lord's anointed. It's what all the prosperity gospel preachers use in order that you can't talk about them and tell them they're wrong. That's what chapter 16 reads like. But when we get to chapter 17 and we look at this very last verse that we have this evening in verse 7, and don't worry, I'm not wrapping up. My third point's not even in this passage. Don't don't fret, we're not getting out early. When we get to verse 7, it's not just about Moses and Aaron anymore. It's about the people. He named the place, that's Moses, Masa and Meribah. And most of the time, when we have names like this, just look a little bit further, and after the because, you're going to know what those two words mean, because that's why they named it that. Because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, that's what the words mean, saying, is the Lord amongst us or not? The name comes because of the quarrel and the quarrel between the sons of Israel led to the second name, the test against the Lord. Namely, that they would ask, is the Lord amongst us or not? And I think the principle that we see here is when we grumble against one another, when we divide, when we quarrel, The reality is, it's not just against one another. It's against a holy and righteous God. It's easy for me to recognize that my sin affects me and my sin affects other people. It's difficult for me to recognize because the Lord is not who I intend to sin against. But every single time that I sin, whether it's the white lie, whether it's the gravest of sins, the, the one that you don't want anybody to know about, whatever it is, that's against a holy and righteous God. And the reality is when we mar the body of Christ, we mar Christ himself. We see this in 1 Corinthians. Flip with me one more time, and then we'll do a lot of flipping, so don't worry. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When Paul tells us of the spiritual gifts, he also tells us of how it's to edify the body of believers. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have three verses I want to look at And really, it's the whole chapter of verse 12 that that teaches this point. But I want to drag out verses 12 and 13 and verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When we mar the body of believers, we mar the very Christ's body himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. 
when it refers to the body here, it is referring to the body of believers, the church. But it's also referring, and we'll see this in verse 27, to the body of Jesus himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. It's the tag at the end, so also is Christ, that shows us this body of believers that gather is like unto Christ himself, so also is Christ. Verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. This is what makes us part of the body, is the baptism of the Spirit, the coming to salvation. And it doesn't matter who we are, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit. There's unity in this room, folks. And in verse 27, it's much more. It transcends just the people in here. Verse 27, Now you, that's a plural you, let me change it to Mississippi talk, now y'all, now us, now you are Christ's body. And individually, members of it. When we quarrel amongst ourselves, when we gripe and complain, when we tear at each other's throats, when drama erupts, we not only come against one another, we are likened to the Israelites who say, is the Lord amongst us or not? We come against the Holy One Himself. Let us be a people that is bound in this bond of love, that in unity, we can build one another up. And the beauty of this passage and the rest of tonight, I, I want to show you that the solution to all of these things, yes, church discipline is a solution in Matthew chapter 18, but the true solution to all these things is the shadow that is seen here in Exodus chapter 17 is realized fully in the New Testament. And that if we will look to the New Testament, the beauty of this passage is revealed there. I first want to make my way to the New Testament by looking at Jeremiah chapter 2. This theme of I'm thirsty is one that is throughout Scripture. And Jeremiah, one of the prophets who prophesies of the coming Christ, has something to say about thirst. Jeremiah chapter 2. I had the privilege when I was at William Carey to take many Hebrew classes, and one of them, um, was a translation class where I translated about half of the book of Jeremiah. And it was in that study in Jeremiah chapter 2 that I found this gem of Scripture that points to who Jesus is. And here we find it in what I think is obscure because I'm, I've not sat through many Jeremiah sermons. I haven't read too much of Jeremiah in one sitting at a time. I haven't gone through a lot of studies in Jeremiah. Here's a gem that I think teaches us something about what Jesus himself is going to say. I'm going to read 13 verses. I'll stop along the way and make some comments. Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We're going to see some things that look back at what we just read in Exodus 17 and look forward to Jesus. Jeremiah 2. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord. That is, he's telling his prophet to do something. I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals. You're following after me in the wilderness through a land not sown. He thinks back upon Israel in its youth. Where is Israel in its youth? In Exodus, when they were first learning to trust God. He remembers back then, and Jeremiah chapter 2 continues in verse 3, Israel was holy to the Lord. The first of his harvest, all who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. And now here is the connection to what we've already read in Exodus 17. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me? That they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt? Yes, they did. They did say all these things. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you came and you defiled my land. 
and my inheritance you made an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord. And with your sons, sons, I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Katim and see and send to Kedar and observe closely and see if there has been any such thing as this. Here he's referring to the present issue in Judah. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now we might have a hard time because Jeremiah is tough. But what's the issue here? He looks back at a people who did not know him, who complained about everything. And he gives a long list of all the things they complained about. But he ends it all in verse 13. What have they done? They have forsaken me. For when you come, when, when there's dissension in the body, it's coming against God himself. And he calls himself by a name here in verse 13. The fountain of living waters. We see this somewhere else. We're about to find it. The fountain of living waters. And what do they do for themselves? They look for water elsewhere. In John chapter 4 and John chapter 7, Jesus calls himself this very living water. The answer to the problems of thirst, the answer to the problems of the Israelites of old, it's found in Jesus. John chapter 4. Who is the God whom they've forsaken, whose name is the fountain of living waters? Jesus refers to himself in such a way. John chapter 4. At the woman at the well, what does she need? I thirst. And Jesus says to her, I thirst. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. In the middle of their dialogue, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Why? Because he is the fountain of living water. He is the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can cure the physical thirst. But he goes on. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. John chapter 7, a few chapters over, Jesus says it again. John chapter 7, in just a few verses, verses 37 through 39. John 7, beginning in verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Here is the one. And it is this Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives us a water in which we will never again thirst. Church, in order to solve bickering, in order to solve grumbling, in order to solve disputes, turn to this one who solves the dispute of Exodus chapter 17. All who are thirsty can come and drink from this one. He is able to solve our bickering. He is able to solve our problems. He is able to supply our every need, for he has again and again and again, more abundantly than ever before, continued and continued and continued to pour out his blessings on those who will trust in him. How much more then, if he can provide for our needs and salvation, if he can provide for our needs in eternal life, if he can provide for the greatest needs of humanity, how much more can he provide for our needs for our silly problems? 
for the disputes that would happen amongst us, for the disputes that would happen outside of these walls, for everything that we would have need of, Christ is ready to provide it for us. What must we do? Cling to him. Cling to the one who's provided before, who's provided in Christ, who died on the cross for your stead, who gave you the security, not of hell, but of heaven for eternity, and is willing and able. Jesus, my Savior, is still willing and able to do miracles today. Trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Bread for us and water that we might never thirst. Lord, help us to cling to your words. Help us to cling to you in our time of need. Recognizing that by ourselves, we are but useless. That we could tear everything that you do away. But Lord, help us instead to recognize that if we would trust in you, if we would put our faith in you, if we would bring our issues to you, Lord, that you're more than able to solve them. Lord, we ask that if there's any issues within our church, Lord, if there's any disagreements across our body, if there's anything, Lord, that you can put your hand in, Lord, help us to take our hands out and let you fix them. For, Lord, you are the only one who can do it. Lord, I pray that you would unify our body through and through, that you would knit us closer together as we see you pour out your blessings upon us, as we hear of those who are saved, of who are making decisions for baptism, who, as we see visitors in our midst, Lord, we ask that you would just continue to pour out your blessings. That in the excitement of all of these things, we would not grow weary by the little things that are happening. But Lord, instead, that you would put us in your will, and that in your will we would find peace. Lord, we ask that as we leave from here, Lord, that you would give us an opportunity in the week ahead to relish in the goodness of God, and also to go and to proclaim what you can do. For we have seen it, and the world around us is needy for a Savior. Lord, as we go, we ask that you would give us a blessing in this week. And Lord, that you would bring us back into your church, that together we might lift up the name of Jesus and worship in the unity and the spirit of truth. Lord, we thank you for a day in your house, and we just ask that you'd be with us as we leave now. And we ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.